guys, welcome. I'm Rob Tatro. I'm here today's special guest, Julian Klamachko. He's founder, CIO, and CEO of Accelerate, and they do ETFs, and they do some pretty neat stuff in the space. And I've known about what Julian's doing for a while. We actually met at one of the, uh, the CASA events, the alternative investment events. I thought it was really neat what you're doing. You're in Winnipeg. You happen to be a Winnipegger, I think. Yep. Yeah, I grew up here. Right on. So you happened to be in town. So I said, let's get together. I want to pick your brain a little bit about these ETFs, this space, why th this is working for you guys. You started, what did you start, four years ago? Yep, four years you ago. You started with zero assets? Correct. So you started with zero assets. You're over, what do you got now? Nine figures or over nine figures now? <laughs> no, just under 100 million. Yeah. So getting close. Congrats. That's really good. And basically, it's encapsulated in four publicly listed traded ETFs on the TSX? Correct, yeah, four hedge fund ETFs on the TSX. And one of them is arbitrage? Correct. One is multi-strategy, yep. absolute return, yep. and a Canadian long short. Yep. Now those words, for those of you that follow alternative investments and what I've done, you've probably heard some of those words in the past. And I think you may have heard that as well. I'm a big believer and I'm gonna challenge you right off the bat. How does this belong in retail portfolios? Yeah, now that's a great question, Rob, and thanks for having me on the show today. I always like to talk about risk management, which is a very important aspect of asset allocation. And the phrase I like to use is risk management before it's too late. And if we look at what happened in 2022, when you had stocks down significantly, bonds down significantly in your traditional 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and one of their worst years ever. Dude, really... you're preaching to the choir, right? <laughs> this is what I've been pounding the table on BNN on my channel for years, saying this day of reckoning would come. Yeah. This day's coming. Yeah. And then we saw it, right? And there's no guarantee that bonds are going to be negatively correlated, i.e. move in the opposite direction of stocks. And we saw that last year. And they say in investing, diversification is the only free lunch. So that's what we provide. Our motto is powering diversification beyond just stocks and bonds. And what we offer is uncorrelated strategies, uncorrelated asset classes. And by uncorrelated, I mean their return or their movement is not dependent on what stocks or bonds are doing. So they're investment solutions that can perhaps zig while their stocks zag. For example, we have an absolute return strategy that was up 15.3% last year, and serves as a great portfolio hedge. And ultimately, what the use of alternatives in general and hedge funds specifically are there to do is to provide a smoother ride for investors. So for an analogy, would you rather drive to a cottage at Lake of the Woods on a dirt road, bumpy, up and down, or a nice, smooth, freshly paved highway? much smoother ride. And on the dirt road, you have a lot of bumps, rougher go of it, and you question if it's the right path. So just a sec, Julie, I got to challenge you right there because yeah. you start off mentioning hedge funds. Correct. Hedge funds have a reputation. Let's right. put it that way. Yeah. Which one of these funds is your hedge funds? Oh, it's called hedge, your absolute return hedge funds. Yeah, all of them are hedge fund strategies lining up in different buckets. And I do want to address, there's common criticisms, which hedge funds, and I used to run private hedge funds issued by an offering memorandum to accredited investors. Did that throughout the credit crisis. And I learned a lot there. The great financial crisis, a lot of people lost a lot of money, highly volatile. A lot of uh, portfolios were hammered throughout that time period. Now, we were running a market neutral strategy at the firm I was at the time. And we provided positive returns in 2008 and 2009. And with that, our clients were very happy. But at the end of the day, our clients say they had $20 million in net worth and their portfolio dropped in half. Their lifestyle is not going to change. However, non-accredited investors, like, for example, my parents, if they had a $500,000 portfolio and that got cut in half to $250,000, that can materially affect their retirement. So I always thought it was unfair that the average retail investor did not have access. So Julian, saying things. the same thing that I've been preaching forever, which is reduced volatility, but uh, again, uh, hedge funds specifically don't have less volatility than equity. If you're marketing to market daily, most of them, they've had 80, 90% corrections, certain hedge funds. Like a hedge fund is a very wide term. Yes, exactly. And it's a very scary term for investors. Yeah, and so first I was gonna talk about the sort of the five main pain points. So number one, high fees. 
Number two, illiquidity. Number three, no transparency. Number four, inaccessible. So not very, not open to non-accredited investors and they can be difficult to use. Subscription agreements, redemption forms, and so on. So what we did at Accelerate, our mission is to democratize alternatives, make them publicly traded and liquid. You can buy and sell any day of the week when the market's open. Make them low cost. Our fees are about 80% lower than our competitors. Make them transparent, where we show exactly how we're running them. Make them easy to use, one-click buy and sell, like an ETF, because they are ETFs, and make them accessible to all. You don't need to be a credited investor. Now, with respect to volatility, Rob, as you indicated, the term hedge fund is like a very kind of broad, and there's a spectrum. It's like when you talk about a stock, oh, stocks are risky. Some stocks are extremely risky, some penny stock that trades on the over-the-counter market. I don't think that's a great comparison to, say, a utility stock. A bank Apple stock. stock. Yeah, or... exactly. And so there's various strategies and various volatilities, and certainly some have blown up with very high volatility. Our strategies, we specialize in low to medium risk strategies. So, for example, our arbitrage strategy, which has about a 10-year track record that I ported over from my previous firm, very low volatility, much lower than your standard bond portfolio. And then we have a multi-strategy that's low, medium, and then our absolute return and our long short are medium risk. They've gone through two bear markets already, 2020 and 2022, unscathed, and the numbers are the numbers. There's liquidity every single day, and they're operating within their investment objectives according to the prospectus. So it really depends. I always say for a hedge fund or any alternative, it's most important to look under the hood in exactly what it's offering. What are the expected returns? What are the expected volatility? And most importantly, what's the correlation? How does it act with respect to other investments? Because some strategies on their own could be quite risky. However, when paired with, say, equities, if they move in opposite, then it actually lowers the overall risk of the portfolio. Yeah. I think my philosophy is the same, right? The f- most important thing is risk-adjusted returns. Like, how right. much volatility are we taking on yeah. for the amount of returns we're generating or yeah. vice versa? Could we reduce the volatility for the amount of returns we're generating? Can mm. we make it easier to sleep at night for our client who wants a 7 8% return? Can we do that? How do we do that? Think outside the box, Rob. Do we have to look at stocks? Do we have to look at bonds? Are there other options? And what I've found a tremendous amount of success is mostly through alternatives that are focused on predictable cash flow and actual real assets. So mm. that's worked very well for us. Stuff like real estate and infrastructure and music royalties and farmland and yep. stuff that you could see and touch and understand and appreciate what you own. The problem that I've always had with this is you don't know what you're getting. It, it feels like you're putting your money into this black box and you're saying, God, I hope this portfolio manager doesn't blow me up. Like, I really don't. I know he says he's going to do this and that. And boy, I hope this doesn't go to zero tomorrow. Whereby when you're buying real estate, you could see it, you could touch it. You know what you own, you know what you have. Yeah, there might be a correction in the real estate market, but I own that. So at Mm -hmm. least I understand that I own that. Or if you own farmland, I own these 640 acres or those five sections or whatever. I always found this to be very difficult. Let's start with the easiest one to understand, which is probably the arbitrage fund. Right. So the arbitrage fund... Yeah, you're telling me before, focus on SPACs. They trade on an exchange. Arbitrage, let's go back to what arbitrage is really. Arbitrage is a situation where maybe you see a vintage t shirt at the local thrift shop, you see it for three bucks, but it's selling on Etsy or Instagram for 50 bucks. There's arbitrage. I can buy it for three bucks and sell it for 50. It's the same shirt, same market, same everything. I can make money just by trading it, just by arbitraging it. In the investment world, historically arbitrage has been you buy a stock on one exchange and with the currency conversion, you're able to make a few extra dollars selling it in a different exchange and there's zero risk for the client. At the same time, you're buying and selling. This is a little different. Tell us about that. Yeah. And so that arbitrage analogy, and that's exactly it. You're basically looking to earn a spread for the same asset without taking on market risk. And that's the most important thing is you're generating an arbitrage spread or what we call a yield. And it doesn't, theoretically, it doesn't matter if stocks go up or bonds go down. You're just looking to generate that arbitrage profit by buying something below its recognizable value. Theory, you're taking all the market risk out. You're trying to. 
Correct. Yeah, and so what a special purpose acquisition company does, or a SPAC, is they raise capital from investors at $10 per unit, and they list on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. And notice how I said unit, not share, because typically they offer you one common share and a mix of warrants. Let's simplify, Julian. You're buying something that's sure. worth $10.50. Yep. You're buying it for $10.30. Exactly. And then you're buying and selling at the same time? So you're waiting. What a SPAC does is it holds uh, treasury bills. So figure it like a, a box of treasury bills or a savings account that you can buy at 98 cents on the dollar. And you can cash out of it in several months, depending on the terms. Mm -hmm. So you can get a premium yield to treasuries because you're getting not on, only that underlying T-bill yield. You're getting the T-bill yield plus you're getting your capital appreciation. Correct. And yeah. that's tax favorable because you're getting a little bump on your NAV. And you don't get taxed on the underlying interest. The because government it's a uses that as capital gains. Okay, so the entire thing becomes a gain. Correct. Okay, so that arbitrage, that SPAC arbitrage ETF, ticker symbol ARB, I believe, yep. how is it done? So we've run it for almost 10 years, done about 8% annualized over the past 10 years. We launched it as an ETF over three years ago, has done 11% annualized as an ETF. Had a big year in 2020 for that strategy because we're not in SPAC arbitrage just to earn 100 basis points above treasuries. The killer part of that strategy is the goal of a SPAC is to merge with a private company. Yeah, some of public. them go. Some of them yeah. will just go and they'll go 10 or 5 Yeah, X. so instead of redeeming at $10.50, if they announce a good deal, we can sell at $11, $12. Some we've sold for upwards of $60. And that's where the strategy really kicks in. I say heads we win, tails we win big. Is there a tails we sell, the market collapses and we sell for six bucks? No, as long as you affect the strategy, i.e. you don't miss the date in which you need to redeem, that's where the risk cash. lies. Yeah, because if they announce a merger and you don't redeem at the end, you own the underlying business and that stock can, it can collapse, it can go. Yeah, you don't want to rise. have market risk. You exactly. want to just, okay. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you don't screw it up. So how would this strategy lose money then? The main way I've seen people lose money and thankfully we haven't done this yet, we have run a tight operation, but I have had calls from an investor. They said, oh, I wanted to do this back arbitrage. Now it's down to $8 and I'm down 20%. What happened? They missed the redemption date and that put floor disappeared. So what happened in 2022 then? I see you're minus 1.5%. Am I wrong on that? No, that's correct. And so we do have fees to run the strategy, obviously. Yields were very low. And where we started, as you remember in 2020 and 2021, SPACs were very like front page news. And so a lot of them, it was problematic that they rallied so much that everything was trading at a premium over its net asset value. So we managed to sell some, but not all of them. And then when they go from like premium 101 cents on the dollar to 98 cents on the dollar, then you have mark to market losses. So it's not no duration, there is some duration there, but the average duration within a SPAC portfolio is, call it three to five months. Rising interest rates can be a slight headwind. We do have a management fee. We have currency hedging costs as well, given that all of our holdings for the most part are US denominated and we need to hedge to okay. the CAD for our Canadian clients. Okay, so that's arbitrage. It does have volatility though. Like it doesn't look like the returns of a real estate alter or an infrastructure alter. Plus 29, plus seven, minus one, plus two, minus one, but a good long-term track record of 8%, you're saying? Correct, okay. yeah, and carries a low risk rating. So we aim for volatility in the high single digits. So okay. it's not no risk, but it is l much lower volatility than you'd find in stocks. Yeah, and again, I wouldn't define volatility Sorry, I wouldn't define risk and volatility as the same way. I know right. that they generally go hand in hand. But mm. to me, risk is much different for when you're managing clients' retail money. I'm managing your parents' money. Yeah. Risk is the likelihood of this thing going belly up or being a significant capital impairment for the client. Volatility, yeah. if I own a quality asset, there's a little bit of volatility. I'm somewhat comfortable with, provided I know that I own a quality asset at a reasonable multiple. Yeah. We don't want to avoid volatility at all costs because then you mm. get no return. Mm -hmm. But you want to get the best volatility, the best return you can for the volatility that you're generating. For right? sure. Let's go to the next one. Maybe... Hedge, yeah. the absolute Tell return me about hedge. strategy. Yeah, the absolute return strategy. Yeah, and so as the symbol indicates, it's there to serve as a portfolio hedge 
for example, last year when lots of stuff was down, it was up 15.3%. And in March of 2020, when everything was down double digits uh, as the COVID bear market, the fastest bear market in history hit, a hedge was one of the few strategies that was up. So s to simplify it, it's a long, short strategy. You're then, trusting a portfolio manager though to make those calls. I'm the portfolio manager and it's 100% systematic. It's a quantitative driven model. And every month we screen all 4,000 stocks in North America and we select uh, for the long portfolio, high quality, attractive valuation, good price momentum, solid operating momentum and a good share price trend. And on the short side, the exact opposite, a low quality, losing money, poor momentum. So at the end of the day, we systematize what a human portfolio manager would do. We don't mess up with the models and the way it works is in a good market, we're going to lag, but hope to generate decent returns from the long portfolio. Then in a bad, the shorts tend to get hammered. For example, we're short Signature Bank, which in March filed for bankruptcy, went to zero. We actually covered at 13 cents, but shorted at 135, covered at 13 cents. And last year, we we're short Carvana and Nikola and Peloton, all these highly speculative stocks that absolutely collapsed. Yeah. But it's the same story that all the hedge fund managers say. I'm going to I'm gonna long the good stuff and short and just trust me, I got this, right? And I got a great quant system and it's not going to let you down. But at the end of the day, I would not define that as an alternative. Like to me, that's not a defense of all. Like you're going to get volatility there. Correct. And the way that we define alternatives are uncorrelated strategies. Right. So they're, they're there to diversify portfolios. Yeah. And the, the cool thing about hedge is when paired with equities, historically, it's reduced the drawdown by 50% okay. of your equities without sacrificing return because it's been slightly negatively correlated. For example, last year when everything's gone down, hedge is going up. And when you combine them, it makes for a smoother ride. Yeah. If I were to, my first question to you was, how does this fit into a retail portfolio? So we advocate for a 50-30-20 approach. So 50% core stocks, 30% core fixed income and cash, and a diversified sleeve of alternatives for 20% of And the what do you think those alternatives should be? Should this be all of this? So it depends on liquidity needs. Ours offer intraday liquidity whenever you want to buy and sell. They provide yield as well. I understand that people like private illiquid alternatives. I advocate for a mixed approach. Some um, of this and some of the other alts. Yeah, exactly. And it is there in a portfolio, I think the more asset classes, the better to a limit. So if you can assemble a portfolio of six to 10 asset classes, including some liquid alternatives, some illiquid alternatives, I think that's a great approach. And even on the illiquid, the private side, some are super risky, whether it's venture capital or leverage buyouts, and some can be quite a bit lower risk. Maybe it's private credit where you're senior secured or something of that nature. Yeah. The risk spectrum exists whether it's liquid or illiquid. Right. Um, let's talk real quick about the other two and then I want to talk about your NFT. Sure. So you got the one, sh that's the diverse. Okay, let's talk the long short real quick. Sure. So long short is what you were just describing. It's your long short fund. It's done well. Yep. It's got- well, It's 150 been. long, 50 short and it's for Canadian. If you want Canadian stock exposure, with mitigated downside. So we can prevent, you'll have say 80 to 90% of the downside participation. The Provided same. your models work, continue Correct. to work like they have worked in the past. Yeah, exactly. And through a period of time where you get double the volatility. Correct, it's, it's like anything. If you own real estate, perhaps the real estate market just craps out. Like we can't guarantee anything in investing. <laughs> Do you see the difference or you disagree with me on this? Like my perspective on say like real estate, for example, and you can look at certain examples now on, on office properties where they're, they utilize leverage and true, they're tangible and you can touch them. However, a lot of them are now worth less than the debt. So not only did the equity go to zero, but they actually owe more than they put into it because they're liable for the mortgage. Well, go back to the investment thesis itself. Sure. So investing in something versus you're actually buying equities. This is equity. Like it, I think it'd be... I would not put this as an alternative asset. For me, I would put this in my equity sleeve okay. because it's equity and I would take less. If I was 50% equity, I would take, and I want to put 5% of this in my portfolio, I'd go 45% traditional equity and 5% 
these type ETFs as equity for me. Okay. I would not consider this alts, especially not the long short fund, because at the end of the day, what do you actually own in there? You own 150% of stock and you're, you're short 50% stock. You Correct. own equity. You're net 100% long equity. Yeah. Uh, Canadian companies. So that's stock to me. That's equity, right? Yeah. And if you consider, say, there's a REIT ETF, if you consider that equity or private REIT, they're the same thing. It's just one trades, one doesn't. Some people prefer the liquidity, but it comes with volatility. But on the private side, I think you're more, they try to mask that volatility and the riskiness of it because you're not marking to market every day. And so there's a distinction there. And there's trade-offs too, right? Do you want liquidity and lower fees or do you want with the disclosed volatility? If that, Because that bothers some people. And then on the private side, do you want the illiquidity, potential gating, being in a private fund for much longer than you want, unable to get your money out, typically higher fees, but they can be typically marked to model instead of marked to market. The long short fund, what was its biggest drawdown? For our ETSX long short? Yeah. Mm, so in March of 2020, that probably would add a pretty significant drawdown because that one would be pretty correlated with Canadian equities. Okay, yeah. so it, it correlates well with Canadian equities. Our ATSX long short, yeah. Last one is your multi-strategy. That is the wrap ETF. Is that the one where you have a bunch of kind of everything in there? Correct, yeah. And what's the breakdown in that one? So it provides exposure to six alternative asset classes, including absolute return, private credit, real assets, global macro, enhanced equity, and inflation protection bucket. We and who that. manages those? Are those sub-advised? So it's 11 alternative strategies, all liquid alternative ETF, 30% accelerate, 70% third party. Oh, wow. Blackstone, BlackRock, BMO. And that was really client driven because there's a lot of investment One ticket advisors, solutions. Yeah, who don't necessarily have the large team like you do or the background and alternatives to put in the time and effort because it can require a lot of work. Not just upfront work, but monitoring, rebalancing, subscribing, redeeming, all that stuff. So we do it ourselves and we charge a, a very low fee, 20 basis points, and it's super easy to use. Just one line item, super simple for know your product purposes. So yeah. It's an ad advisor driven business solution meant to save time and be much more efficient. Okay. I, I give the analogy, like if you want exposure to US equities, would you rather buy SBY ETF or all 500 stocks? So there's that efficiency component to it. Right. Thanks for taking the time from Accelerate. Julian, it was a pleasure. Really enjoyed having you in Winnipeg in your hometown. Yep. Thanks for coming. We'll have you on again. That was really fun.